The hardest time of day after losing Demma is in the morning. I wake up and do a checklist of what my life is. I go through and determine where I'm waking up, what day of the week it is, and then quickly the reminder of Demma jars me like driving into a ditch. My feelings go flying like stuffed animals without a seatbelt. It's hard to juxtapose death with the innocence of a domestic loving animal. You get into the habit of defending and protecting this loving friend that depends on you, and suddenly you've quit your job because the big authoritative death comes along and doesn't care about all the loving work you've put into sustaining this life. Seeing her on the vet's table about to be euthanized felt so contrary to my heart. She was still and blind, and I projected so much feeling of fear into her mind, though she was probably not aware of anything at all. I had the desire to take whatever anesthesia they were giving her so I could see if it hurt, but it would kill me. If I could buy a non-lethal experience for a few hundred dollars to take home, I would have. Instead, I kissed Emma and cried and felt embarrassed. She laid on a pillow we carried her on from home, unable to direct her attention to anyone and breathing sharply. She was dying what people call a natural death. I've always respected the natural death as a story to cherish like that of a deep and passionate romance. One of many stories of life and the human condition that humans hope to one day attribute to their own existence. But death is complicated with so many ways of dying and the varying causes that get you there. It's also ugly, regardless of how peaceful it can possibly be. I always imagined a natural death like a deep sleep you never come out of, where you slowly dim to sleep because your irreplaceable batteries are wearing down. I pictured a natural death bloodless and gentle, I always imagined an ethereal place in your brain where there was a microscopically thin spiderweb thread tethered to your last connection of life, and in your final predetermined sleep, a moderate psychic wind comes and blows it in half, and that's a natural death. I keep having thoughts like these because I'm approaching Dumba's death too cerebrally. Thinking is most certainly different than feeling, but they're both functions of the brain. Right now, unless I'm crying, I'm trying to understand what happened to my friend, and I'm doing it as an escape. I feel bad for people with the notion that thinking is the same as feeling. They don't even have an opinion on the difference. They just don't understand what's happening in their own perception. Thinking self-guided and requires effort. It's controlled and strengthens mental stamina and focus, and it usually has a plan even if it's just a few steps in front of the current thought. Feeling lets go of your agenda and moves with the crazy wind of your mind crashing yourself into the ancient human landscape. That's how you gain insight and wisdom, by letting go of what you presuppose as the course and humbling yourself to the true nature of this warm-blooded experience. Demma was cold when she was about to die, and a vet tech wrapped her in a blanket. The woman that did this for Demma appeared to have some kind of dwarfism, and she held Demma's body so affectionately. Demma's eyes had a dark green reflection and a thin grainy film over them. The woman that wrapped her in the blanket supported her head in a way that animated Demma, as if she were looking in our direction. There was such a childish kindness in this that spoke directly to my fragile juvenile feelings. Making the decision to euthanize Demma was hard to make, though it seemed obvious that it was the only decision to make. The vet told us that there was a 5% chance that she could come out of her condition if she had been poisoned though she wouldn't make a full recovery since whatever afflicted her was neurological. During the time of waiting for recovery, we'd have to watch her around the clock since she couldn't even move her body. We'd have to blink her eyelids to keep them moist. It sounded like emotional torture that would leave us with a blind and bedridden dog at best and a prolonged death at worst. She offered this possibility simply for the fact that it was a possibility. Once we made the decision, we had to wait for Demma to be ready. They asked if we wanted to be there when we euthanized her, and Bridget and I both initially said no. We changed our minds, and I'm ashamed at my initial reaction. Part of me felt it would be morbid, and I was just too afraid. I picked the vet's brain a little more before confirming our decision. She mentioned that Demma showed some signs of alertness when we visited her earlier. She thought Demma might be able to hear us. We then changed our minds and decided to be with her. Morbid or not, Demma probably didn't want to be alone. A vet tech closed out our tab in the room. I paid with my MasterCard. I signed my name with a meaningless X dotting my eye. I placed the pen in the plastic tray and handed it back to her and even heard myself thank her. 
I sat with Bridge and we talked about whether it was the right decision or if we were really even given one. We told funny stories about Demma that made us tear up without the laughter. We saw that we were getting old and that our story was progressing into foreign territory. World companions die and some adventures aren't fun. In the moment I wanted to say something or be someone that would turn all this on its head, but the gravity of the situation kept me down. We were coming down from a ten-year cloud. I tried to grow up a little by getting a professional job and I almost thought that this was life telling me that this is what I asked for. The nurse rushed in and told Bridge and I that Demma was actively dying and that they were going to administer the drug. We walked fast after her and came up to Demma. This is where I kissed her and cried. I called her Doodle, her natural name, and made sure to talk a lot in case she could hear me. They injected her, placed a stethoscope on her chest, and said she was gone. The vet tech that had wrapped a blanket around her, who I hate referring to as the lady with dwarfism because I was so much acquainted affection for, slowly and gently let Demma's head down as if to rest during the injection. She had so much empathy and heart. There was no mind game or disrespect in her actions of lowering Demma's head. She was simply so involved and committed to the experience that she might not have even consciously known what I'm telling right now. Bridge and I walked out of the vet office, and it had magically turned from day to night. It felt like a different parking lot, one lit with dated lamps that brightly illuminated everything with a dreamlike greenish blue. The vivid scene registered like the foggy backdrop of an intensely emotional dream. I was hypersensitively drawn to Bridget as her sadness was the only gravity strong enough to pull me in any direction. We were linked, huddled together, and sobbing through the dark and luminescent concrete lot. We walked to the car and cried two powerful cries in one another's arms like two new souls that didn't know death. Bridge asked me more than once if I wanted her to drive us home as if I was drunk with sadness. I promised I was fine and we drove home staring through glossy headlights shining on the decayed back streets of a once beautiful Reseda. The autumn days grow short and cold It's Christmas time again Then snows of winter slowly melt The days grow short And then he turns the seasons around And so she changes her gown Mother Earth and Father Time How very special are we For just a moment to be Part of life's 